been a while since I've done one of these. Hello and welcome to issue <laughs> bagged and boarded. <laughs> We've got a great show for you today. I finally watched Black Adam, and I have some thoughts. Here's what hurts about Black Adam. There was so much potential for this one, guys. It really had a shot. Pierce Brosnan as Dr. Fate was unmatched, honestly. It was absolutely fantastic. Dwayne Johnson as Black Adam was not horrible either. I enjoyed the supporting cast. I loved the guy who played Hawkman for just kind of being like a power hungry little ass. Uh, this, this is what makes this hard to talk about because there's truly so much going for this movie that this is one of the first movies I've ever watched that as I was watching it, I kept pausing and saying, I wish I wrote this script. Isn't that crazy? I am a professional writer, but I'm not a professional screenwriter. My discussion of Black Adam is very, very specific because I'm gonna talk about the six things I would change to make Black Adam good. And I think this will really give you an idea of what I loved about the movie and what I really think needs to change about the movie because I don't know if I would recommend watching it. I think there are parts of it that are very enjoyable, but I also think it really needs to be edited. I'm gonna start with the first thing. The movie starts with, I timed it, quite literally over 10 minutes of exposition. We don't even see Black Adam or The Rock until 17 minutes into the movie. <laughs> This is the most fearless superhero movie I've ever seen. The reason I say it's fearless is Moon Knight didn't do this. Black Panther didn't do this. The closest thing that came to addressing the issues that came up in Black Adam was Iron Man. American superheroes only come to the Middle East when they want something. They literally draw a parallel to the Middle East now. And they do it in a way that, like I said, is unfucking flinching The rest of the world sees Black Adam as a villain, but to the people of Kondok, this fictional Middle Eastern city, he is a hero. And they view the Justice Society as villains. They discuss slavery. And they discuss how ever since they overthrew the yoke of slavery, it's been one group after another with guns keeping them down. Justice Society comes in and they're like, you can't kill these people. And the people living in Kondok are like, do you know how many people these people have killed? And Black Adam says, if we let him go, he's going to go kill more people. We're not talking about, oh, innocent bystanders. We're talking about private military guys. These are people that wield automatic weapons. You cannot come up with a better bad guy than them. They kill people and loot the land and steal relics for money. I think that they could have just been more creative in how they showed that. They could have just shown us that and trusted the audience to have the intelligence to pick up on these deeper themes. Instead, what they give you is a bunch of exposition what I would have done personally is I would have shown them in the past as slaves to a tyrannical monarch and then have Black Adam be locked up. Because one of the big reveals, spoilers, is that at the end you find out he was locked away by the wizards because he was found unworthy of the power. I don't think that was a big twist. I think that they should have just said that from the outset. They should have shown that amazing fight instead of constantly doing these expedition jumps. And then had like 20 minutes into the movie, you see him get locked into the thing and then you hear Shazam and he comes out and like from his POV, he's just in the modern era. And then what you can do is while he's interacting with the other characters in the story, he finds out about what's happening in Kondok in the last however many years. 
and the audience finds out too. You don't have to do an exposition dump if you're smart about how you set up your scenes. We have a hero that has been inserted very suddenly into the modern age. We are watching the story from his POV, and so the audience now has this perfect vehicle to learn about what has happened to Kondok since the age of this tyrannical king. We get to learn because the character's learning. A perfect storytelling vehicle. Stop doing the exposition and just show us what's happening. Okay, number two. At one point in the movie, there is, there is this villain who's imbued with the power of hell and he looks so stupid, chat. He looks truly stupid. And he's got this big pentacle on his chest and he looks, I'm sorry, he just looks ridiculous. There's no other way for me to put it. I think the entire subplot with the crown, we could have cut it and just had Black Adam fighting the Justice Society. They have this entire thing where the undead army starts pouring out into the city. This is a major event that's happening and... They keep cutting away from this dope fight between Dr. Fate and this demon to go to this very stupid fight with all of these undead and the citizens of the city. Honestly, you have this little kid trying to be like, come on, this is our city. We have to fight to take it back. There's two reasons I hated it. Number one, the place that happens in the movie, none of us care. Like anybody watching does not care about that. Number two undermines one of the main narratives in Black Adam makes a big point of being like, why do you people need a champion? Why do you need a hero? Why can't you fight? And there's this point Adriana is making or trying to make about how she shouldn't have to teach her kids violence. And number two, they're normal people up against people with body armor and grenades and hover bikes and automatic weapons. So having this entire plot shoehorned in from the end of the movie, this little kid's going to rouse the people of the city to fight undead denizens of hell. To me, it just kind of undermined the main narrative of the film, which is that they shouldn't have to risk life and limb for their city constantly. The biggest thing is it comes at a part in the movie where you're already thinking to yourself, this movie should have been over 30 minutes ago. And you're cutting from the things that are going to end the movie to the subplot you just don't care about. Okay. There are two things in the movie that I really liked. <sighs> One thing I love about the DCU, unlike the MCU, is the DCU does not care about power level at all. And I love it. They they have good chunks of the movie in slow motion because Teth Adam moves so fast, you wouldn't be able to see it happen. He wouldn't even look like he's flying. He just looks like he's there. He looks like he's not there. The reason I say I love that they don't care about power level isn't necessarily because of Black Adam, which I do respect that they made Black Adam very powerful. It's actually because of my favorite character from this movie, Dr. Fate. I did not go in being like Pierce Brosnan and Dr. Fate is going to be like my ride or die. First of all, amazing actor. Second of all, they will literally show like three quick like boom, boom, boom scenes back to back. And it's of Dr. Fate seeing the future. Dr. Fate really showed us what Dr. Strange could have and should have been. Because here's the thing. When people are watching a movie in theaters... They don't have the ability to pause and rewind. So the way they flash those scenes so quickly, it gives you a sense of what's going to happen, but it's not a spoiler. And I think that's so brave to include clips of what's going to happen. What it highlighted was this is what happens when you have a comic book cinematic universe that's not afraid to have one character that's way more powerful than all the rest of the characters. And let's keep it a buck. In the MCU, that should and would be Doctor Strange. There's one character that's probably going to be a degree of power more powerful than everyone else. It would be Doctor Strange. And yet, I feel like they're afraid of making him more powerful. I love that DC was just like, he has the power to stop literally the rest of the justice society and he does he has the power to stop 
the entire justice society and does. I don't think they would do that in a Marvel movie. Like, look at what they did to the Hulk. They basically neutered him because they don't want to have one character that's so much more powerful than the rest. So this brings me to my next point. You have this amazing hero that's incredibly powerful that splits themselves into 30 different pieces and is fighting the big bad. Why do you kill him in the first movie? Girl, I would have came and watched Black Adam 2 just for Dr. Fate. I liked a lot of how they handled Black Adam. I think we needed more time to see Black Adam's personality, especially in terms of like with the family. But I liked how Black Adam holds a mirror to the Justice Society and shows them their own hypocrisy. They're basically cops arresting Black Adam. They don't care about how they destroy the city, and they don't care about the issues the people in the city are dealing with. They just care about arresting Black Adam. And the biggest offender out of these, and I actually like the way he's portrayed as Hawkman, I will actually deign to say that Hawkman is not a particularly likable character. It's a likable actor and he does the role well, but the character itself is kind of a piece of shit. He makes horrible decisions. He's got a very bad temper. The things he does are morally ambiguous at best. He's just a puppet of the U.S. government. He's not a good guy. Point number three is that Black Adam kind of shift in attitude, a major shift in attitude towards Hawkman all of a sudden. He goes from disliking the guy, which makes perfect sense given the writing, to all of a sudden being like, toward, at the end of the movie being like, you know, uh, he is a hero and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, is he a hero? This unfolds this way because of how poorly they handle the final fight. Dr. Fate is basically sacrificing himself to buy time for Black Adam to get out of prison and come kill the big bad. Personally, I think they should have just cut the entire bit where he's trying to get out of the prison, cut the entire bit where he's fighting the big bad with Hawkman. I think it would have been so much more powerful if you just cut all of that and instead had Dr. Fate appear to him, tell him, hey, Teth Adam, your people need you. And he breaks out of the tank, says Shazam, comes flying back. It would have been so much more powerful if he sees Dr. Fate die. And that's what inspires him because it's probably one of the coolest scenes in the film. He grabs the demon by both horns and literally rips him down the middle. It was actually kind of cool. But to me... It would have been much better if, like, what drove him to do that was seeing the only person he respected and liked, Dr. Fate, dying. It would have made the death more impactful. It would have made the commentary about what it means to be a hero stronger. Because Dr. Fate is a hero in the purest sense of the word. While all of the rest of the superheroes are getting these dick measuring contests and beating each other up, he's the only one that's like, Actually, these people need our help. There's this really powerful relic here. It could potentially lead to these people dying. The fact that he doesn't even see Dr. Fate as he's dying is such a weird choice narratively. Um, it doesn't explain why all of a sudden his relationship with Hawkman changes. We don't really understand where that growth comes from. It would have made more sense if what spurned him to consider what it means to be a hero was Doc Fate. Point number four, the coolest part of the movie for me was this divide of the Justice Society are the good guys in America, but they're not really the good guys over here. If I was the writer, that would have been the whole premise of the film. I don't think we needed this whole demon sabak and this stupid fucking crown. I think it should have been a MacGuffin for them to get to the tomb. They're looking for this relic and instead they find Black Adam. 
I would have cut all of that and had more scenes with Teth Adam, his family, his son, so that when we realize that his family was ripped from him, we have more feelings for them. I would have liked to have seen him building rapport with the little kid. We just see him care about the little kid, but don't really know why. Point number five. There's a scene where Teth Adam explodes out of his rage. And when he does, he ends up hurting the very kid he was trying to save because he's so hellbent on killing this person that while he's doing that and exploding, the kid that he was trying to save in the first place, another one of the Justice Society members throws himself over the kid to save him. And then out of nowhere, one of the characters says, you cried when Harut died. They do this whole exposition once again of, oh, well, his kid died. You know what would have been much better? If when he sees the kid on the floor and he sees instead of Adam Smasher, Hawkman protecting the kid, duh, he sees in the kid, he sees his child and he has a flashback. That would have made more sense than all of the exposition. It was right there. You had the whole moment set up where you see that the very kid he's trying to protect, he goes supernova rage and instead almost kills the kid. Right there. You didn't have to do the whole, you cried when her root died. Ooh. I think personally, Hawkman should have done something to save the kid. And I think it would have been this great moment of Black Adam realizing that, yeah, these people are the heroes. They saved the kid. I'm not. They have this whole scene after all of that where the, one of the characters is like, who's Harut? Why did, you know, why did they say you cried? Who is he? That entire scene was so weird. They do this multiple times, by the way, where they're like, we need a plot device to do this thing. And they choose the least good one. There's a crazy demon in the air. Okay. And the ship's AI says, <clears throat> readings indicate that it's the demon Sabak. You had a character there that's been studying this lore. You have Dr. Fate. How does your ship's AI have demon detection capabilities? Demon radar aside, okay. Number six. The action sequences in the movie have no real stakes or real teeth in them. The slowdown sequences are a little gratuitous and they don't always look good. Their usage of music, and this really is, I think, point number six. The movie lacks a creative director. I think that when you make a movie or any piece of media, you need to have a vision board and everything needs to align towards the vibe you're trying to put your audience in a setting. And you can't do that when you have themes that are disparate. A good example of this is Loki. How does Loki become evocative of this very unique vibe? They use a theremin in their intro music. That doesn't seem like a big deal, but the theremin was has a very weird, spacey kind of sound, but also sounds a little retro. It was used in Doctor Who's intro sound or intro music. All of the theming is very 1970s. The way the characters are styled, music choices, like everything works together to put you in a setting. The same is also true of, hell, Batman, you know? Now that I think about it, DC has done it before, too. This movie doesn't truly have a moment where it all comes together. The music choices were all over the place. I feel like the one that fit best was Power by Kanye, but they used it for such a small period of time. There's no cohesiveness with the music. There's no general theme. It just kind of feels like a fan edit for the most part. 
your music choices are really important in terms of setting the mood for who this character is. Is this character angry, sad? But it literally just feels like someone edited and put on TikTok because there's no common thread between the songs. Not even one that like recurred at any point. Does he even have a theme song? I don't know. Ultimately, Black Adam had a lot of potential. It was somewhat enjoyable to watch, but I was left wishing that they had used that potential to make a truly good movie. I think they could have. And I think that's what sucks. Like, Thor, Love, and Thunder... There was no saving that one. But, like, this one, oh, man, a little bit of editing, a little bit of polish, a tighter script, and they could have really had something special, and they could have really had something good. And instead, we got what was yet another underwhelming insert into the DCU. And that's my Black Adam review. First up is the Backlog Attack Log, which is a section in which I try to make a dent in the massive backlog of comics I have accumulated. First up, <sighs> Doctor Strange Fall Sunrise. This isn't in a Mylar bag, so I think you know where this is going. For as stunningly beautiful as this comic is, there are sections of it that I can't tell what's happening because of the art style. It just gets really busy and headache-inducing in places. That being said, it reminds me of some of the stuff from The Dreaming. So if you're a fan of the Sandman comics and its spinoffs, this might be up your alley. But... The plot is a little bit slow and a little bit confusing, but I do like that the direction that the art has taken. I do like the direction that the comic in general has taken. It's very trippy. It's very existential. Uh, next up, also didn't make it into a Mylar bag, Hexware. Hexware is about a housekeeping android that through the power of magic pagan rituals gains some degree of sentience in return for carrying out some dark entity's will it was just kind of mediocre if i'm being honest it seems like a bunch of people that like big titty goth bitches wrote it and it doesn't have any real teeth uh, the plot was hmm and the setting is, hmm. I've still been keeping up with Alien. This is up to issue three now. This is by Marvel, not Dark Horse. We're still following Steel Team Six. Steel Team Six is a team of synthetics who, who have been sent to retrieve a sample of a xenomorph egg that might hold the cure to people withstanding radiation because there's a nuclear reactor meltdown on one of the major farming colonies so Wayland yutani assembles steel team six and promises them that they will get them their papers so that they're recognized as people if they carry out this task now things have gone south on the planet they're on and they actually do come across some humans, which was a big plot twist in the last episode. And now they're trying to figure out how these humans have stayed alive despite being exposed to such dangerous levels of radiation and being on a planet completely overrun by xenomorphs. As they try to descend further into one of the main hives that has a queen and potentially one of the specimens they need to successfully complete their quest. I really like it. I like the art. I like the pacing. I loved the story arc they had before this one. 
I've been following this comic for about two years now. You can start with this arc, which is why they kind of restart the numbering and just kind of jump in. This comic is called Once Upon a Time at the End of the World. It's a post-apocalyptic comic where there's these giant like glaciers made of melted plastic in the sea and this person who's been living in the wasteland springs the leak in their boat all of a sudden and comes across this guy that's been living safely in a tower for the entire time and has no experience of what it actually takes to survive in this wasteland. It is kind of a meat cute. And as evidenced by the cover, it's very obviously going to be a post-apocalyptic love story. I do like it for those reasons. It did do one of those tropey things I don't like where at the end it cut to the future and where all of this is going. And I just, I don't know why. It was corny to me the way it was done and the way it was used. But in other contexts, I haven't hated it as much. I don't think this needed it. But I do like the art. And I will say I'm probably going to be picking up the next two just to see how they go. I kind of got this book thinking I was going to love it. It was going to be my pick of the week. And instead I got it and was kind of like, mm, that could have gone better. Next. I actually really like this book more so than I expected. I checked out Punchline. I read the first two. Punchline is the Joker's newest ex-girlfriend. This comic goes into precisely how she's different from Harley. Batman sort of talks about how Harley was manipulated and groomed and molded by the Joker personally, whereas Punchline was influenced or is a product of coming up in a time where the Joker operated. And she's symptomatic of a bigger problem. She doesn't really have any regard for human life. And it shows she's smarter than Harley. Not necessarily Harley and Quinzel, but Harley Quinn. She's a little more ruthless than Harley. And she's less about the quippy jokes and more about the irony, if that makes sense. She's a little bit more of a goth clown. And because of that, I like her more than Harley. I think it's between Punchline and Harley, I would rather date Punchline. First comic book actually has an entire sequence with a streamer who's like trying to live stream from like all these shady places in Gotham. And then his stream goes viral when he gets jumped under a bridge and Punchline continues to beat the shit out of him. He goes from like 10 viewers up, but it also details how shitty chat is when he gets jumped. People are like, the stream just got interesting. And someone else is like, ah, this guy kind of has it coming. Everybody sits there and eggs him on to do crazier and crazier things in his chat. And then they sit back and, and watch him get killed and it just increases his fame until his stream is eventually banned. The overarching story of the comic is that she is trying to sell drugs. To, to <laughs> she So here's, here's why I think she's actually a very dangerous villain. She knows the legal rules. And so she's not only managed to get out of jail by finding the perfect legal plea, but she's managed to find a drug that they cannot ban the components of because they have like very important uses in industry. And so she's figured out this perfect way to peddle this drug that it can't be traced back to her. It can't really be banned because it has other uses and it fucks people up, but also has a chance of killing them. And she sells it and she is putting together the card gang again. The reason she's doing that is she wants to take over this production house on the docks so she can make more of her drugs and sell them. So she is not like Harley where there is some kind of subplot where she's just trying to find a roommate in Jersey. She's trying to make a new Royal Flush Gang using members of the old Royal Flush Gang. And here's the best part is how she makes her way into their house. She goes on an online website and pretends that she's down for a threesome. Because I guess this couple that used to be the king and queen of the royal flush gang, they're into some kinky stuff. So she basically hits them up on a website and is like, I'll be your third. <laughs> and then she shows up and she's like, Hey, boomers, do you want to be relevant again? Because if so, I'm your only shot. I would like to see her beat Catwoman's ass. I'm not going to lie. I think it's coming. 
And I kind of want to see it because this bitch crazy chant. This bitch crazy. And I'm here for it. I've really been enjoying this series. Batman, One Bad Day, Penguin number one. Penguin is one of my favorite of the Batman's rogues gallery. And the reason I really love this book is this outlines Penguin rebuilding his empire using nothing but $20. He literally starts this comic with $20 in his pocket and a black eye. And by the end of it, he has an empire again. And it really shows us how Penguin gets what he wants. Very cleverly written. It does truly take place over one day. I think if you're a fan of the Penguin, you're going to be a fan of this. He learns a lot from his past mistakes. And he, li he literally uses his first 20 bucks to buy this crappy gun that doesn't even look like it's going to work. And the person he buys it from takes pity on him when he says he can't afford bullets and he gives him one bullet and tells him to kill himself. And Penguin takes that one gun with the one bullet and turns it into a nicer gun with three bullets and is like, see, I'm already coming out ahead. And from there, <laughs> and from there turns one gun with three bullets into a whole lot more. So... This series of comics has been great. I really enjoyed this one. Definitely recommend checking it out. If you're a fan of Batman villains, hot off the press. We're going to start with my pick of the week, which this should be no surprise, but it's Batman One Bad Day, Mr. Freeze. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Freeze's one shot dropping during the holiday season while I was in a snowstorm. First of all, Mr. Freeze is probably my favorite villain of all time after Sinestro. I absolutely love him. This story is so heartwarming. It gives you extra context about Mr. Freeze's relationship. It gives you more context about Batman. It gives you more context about... Robin and how he stays positive in the game while being a young kid in Batman's shadow. At one point, this is so cute. Alfred makes a Christmas tree out of batarangs. Have you ever heard of anything cuter than that? At another point, Batman dresses up as a sidewalk Santa that's accepting donations and takes out a gang of bike thieves with his charity bell. I don't want to spoil any more about it, but it's just such a great encapsulation of why Freeze is a character that you love but also hate. I, this is another one where I just don't know how it's going to go for me. It's called Behold Behemoth by Boom. It, this one had absolutely stunning art, gorgeous art. In this comic, the world is coming to an end. There's like all of these portents that are happening that have led to this fundamentalism. You have people on TV being like, look at the meteors flying from the sky, look at the earthquakes, the world's ending, and people being religious nut jobs a little bit. And this guy is having very strange visions. He can't tell what's real and what's not. I will say I'm intrigued off of the first one, but I'm not super like in love with it, which leads me into the most underwhelming selection of the week. Dark Web number one. So as context, I was not super up to date on Spider-Man when I dived into this, but this is a number one. It's needlessly convoluted. I cannot tell what the hell is happening in this comic. Jean Grey's clone, who was killed, teams up with Peter Parker's clone, who was killed by the Gold Goblin. They are trying to use Venom to exact their revenge. Y'all, it ain't for me. I also, chat, was excited for Madeline Pryor to be featured in a comic but this was not what I was expecting the whole premise of the comic and Ben's rage is that because his memories were selectively removed or the memories that were deemed to be Peter's were removed he is only left with the memories of the trauma and the pain and he feels that he is entitled to the full package and that too much was lost when Peter's memories were removed 
and he blames Gold Goblin for this and is trying to kill him. And you're just kind of like, okay. Next. This one's off the wall, but it was actually kind of fun. Blade, Vampire Nation. Let's talk about it. Dracula has created a sovereign state for vampires in Chernobyl. <laughs> because the radiation doesn't kill them. <laughs> kill them. <laughs> it's actually kind of... <laughs> Listen, I'm laughing, but this is actually kind of funny. And so now there's like a sovereign state of vampires in Chernobyl and here's actually what sold me on this comic the lore is as deep as a world of darkness book there's actually deep lore because apparently taking all the vampires and putting them in one place upends everything about vampire culture right so they also need humans so they have to bring humans in to live in the very outer rings of the fallout, the exclusion zone, because most of the vampires are belong to the aristocracy and are used to having familiars and are used to not doing anything, these humans come in and in exchange for like protection, they clean and do stuff during the day and are paid to do that. They live alongside the vampires in what is a like mutually beneficial business transaction some vampires get so bored of having their food in a non-violent fashion and they want to hunt they get bored like cats there is another group of humans that are like down on their luck desperate like basically squid game situation in return for living a life of extreme leisure and luxury occasionally the vampires will just attack them and they have to run and survive do you want to live a life of excess luxury yeah okay well one of these days a vampire might start chasing you run you just have to hope you're faster than whatever loser is sitting next to you that's how they keep some of the vampires from going unhinged because they get so bored of having their food out of a bag. And there's politics and there's a social hierarchy. I'll just say there's a lot of world building and lore for what amounts to vampires in Chernobyl. And I don't hate it. I actually liked it. So Blade Vampire Nation. Why not? I'd subscribe. I'd subscribe twice. I really liked the Timeless book. This is about Kang. And the premise of this book is so amazing. This scholar who specializes in villainy and in the study of villains writes an article about how the greatest villain of all time is Doom. Our homie Kang feels some type of way about this. So he goes back in time to when this guy is only writing about doom. And he's like, Hey loser, I had some respect for you and your work on villainy until you wrote this stupid fucking article about how doom is the greatest villain of all time. And the dude's like, well, no, no, no. I haven't published that article. It's just notes. And he's like, no, you're about to publish it though. And it's going to be very popular. So we're going on a field trip. And the writer's like, what? And he's like, you're going to come with me. And by the end of it, you're not going to say that Doom is the greatest villain of all time. All right? Let's fucking go. He takes this man on an unhinged adventure throughout the course of this book to prove that he has a bigger dick than Doom. And it's just so funny because every time he's just trying to prove that he is so much better than Doom. and He's more intelligent. He thinks further ahead. He's just so much better than Doom. And that's the entire premise of the comic. And it's really good. And the villain at the end is not who you would expect. And this makes me more excited for the upcoming Ant-Man movie because... I hope I'm not setting my expectations too high. 
But Comic Book King is so cool. So cool. And if they can make him even 10% as cool as the comic book version, that movie's going to be so good. It's the joyless nerd moment. Let's talk about D&D. For those of you that have the pleasure of not being involved with D&D discourse on Twitter, number one, do me a favor and don't get involved. Number two, D&D has this thing called the open gaming license. It essentially allows people to play D&D, write modules for D&D, write source books for D&D, do all of this stuff. And as long as they adhere to the guidelines as laid out in the OGL and don't use specific copywritten terms, they can create stuff for D&D, adventures for D&D, source material for D&D, all this stuff, and sell it and monetize it and do all of this stuff without having to pay D&D or get their permission. There are some big projects that use the OGL and make lots of money. In fact, there are full-time publishers like Green Ronin, Kobold Press, EDM that all make content for and around 5th edition and utilize the open gaming license. Some of those supplements are raising over $2 million on Kickstarter and don't have to pay D&D anything because of the OGL. Okay. There was a leak a few days ago where it basically came out that not only was Wizards going to change the license moving over, but that they were going to rescind the previous license as well. And that if you make over $50,000 with your product in a year, you have to not only register as a licensee with Wizards of the Coast, but if you make over $750,000 in a year, they're entitled to 25% of it. It's not a small amount. 25%. Now, there's two things that have got me annoyed. The changes themselves are already pretty annoying. I will give you that. But the other part of this that is annoying is how stupid people on Twitter are. This is a hobby centered around reading, and yet it feels like some people can't fucking read. You had some people flip out about, well, this means we can't monetize our content, which isn't true. You can monetize content that falls under the fan content policy. The problem is that once you crack 50,000, you have to register as a licensee. And this is the part that bothers me. They can, and this is what the internet's been freaking out about. They can theoretically you use your stuff. Now, there's several lawyers who have actually weighed in on this and said that it doesn't give them the rights to your stuff. Actually, what it is is boilerplate language. And it's actually there to protect wizards from you making something and then saying, they copied me, which already happens a lot, if I'm being honest. There's a lot of stuff that gets released at Wizards and then people say, oh, but that was my idea five months ago. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. But this essentially is pretty boilerplate to cover Wizards' ass so that if they ever make a show that's similar to something that you've made or done or run, you can't sue them and say they stole your idea. Unfortunately the internet isn't lawyers and this is a leak. So the way it came off was wizards is going to take my content and sell it and do what they want with it, which ostensibly they could, but that would be very difficult to enforce in court. A lot of people's solution to all of this has been, Oh, go play X game or go play Y game a lot of the solutions being peddled are not viable solutions. Number one, you don't know that the rest of the industry is going to follow suit. 
Number two, if you're fleeing from this OGL into another game and you haven't read that publisher's OGL, what are you doing? <laughs> that doesn't really solve your problems, right? Because then the new company you're fleeing to can copy strike you or can demand a portion of your income. One, the two of the big sort of games that have been proffered, especially to me on Twitter, as alternatives are Warhammer Fantasy and Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And here's the issue with Warhammer Fantasy. I beg you to do like two minutes of research. Games Workshop's uh, history of content creation and supporting content creators isn't the greatest. So saying, oh, you don't like the OGL? Go to this other company that might literally have your shit taken down is not exactly the serve you think it is. Lastly, Pathfinder operates under the OGL as well. So we don't know how this is going to go. Pathfinder 2nd Edition was named in an article by Polygon as being one of the companies that's going to be affected by this change because Paizo has the OGL on its website, even though they're not necessarily using the legacy IP and you can't copyright game mechanics it's still one of those cases where they could go to court. So I'm not sure if running to Pathfinder is exactly the solution here. It's the same reason why I love Alien, but I've never really done an Alien RPG. Very similar reasons. I can't be sure that they're not going to come after me and say that I hurt their IP or sue me because at the end of the day, I did not create... The aliens universe it's not mine and therefore creating fanfic within that universe becomes muddled territory but I feel like if a bunch of big D&D creators started branching out and making other stuff you'd be able to not have this over reliance on D&D you'd be able to do stuff like GTA RP, do stuff like the Project Zomboid RP server I made instead of this, which is always just playing D&D, &D, five nerds around a table, rolling dice. I think there's a lot of innovation to be had in the field. And I hope eventually the industry moves that way. That being said, I also feel like they're going to walk this back because there's basically no one in favor of it I think eventually even if they walk it back they will move towards something like this because what they've made clear is that they never made the OGL with the intent of creating competitors that were going to outsell their own books I don't see Dimension 20, Critical Role. I, do, I don't see the big dogs giving 25% of their income to d and I don't see that happening. I think they'll just play something else. And in the interim, you fucked all of the mid-sized creators who love your product. And if the point of the OGL wasn't to... The point of the OGL wasn't to arm your competitors and yet you find that they're outselling your own modules and source materials. The solution is very simple. Create modules and source materials that people want to buy. Because some of these last ones were like not it. This has been another episode of Bagged and Boarded. I always say it's going to be the last one, but I don't know if it is. 
Maybe it will. 